All right. Welcome to the first ever live Enemies of the State. I'm your host, Alex Hoffman from Sequential State. I'm Rob Clough from High Low. I'm Jules Bakes, freelance critic. And I'm Daniel Elkin from Your Chicken Enemy. Enemies of the State is a monthly comics book roundtable podcast. We take one book each month and talk about it for an hour. Uh, this episode is brought to you live by our friends at uh, Small Press Expo, and we're here today with Casey Nowak and talking about her Ignatz winning Girl Town, published by Top Shelf in 2018. Girl Town is a collection of short stories and includes previously uh, Ignatz winning works, um, um, Radishes and Diana's Electric Tongue, in addition to two new stories. Um, I'm excited to have you on the show today because we want to talk to you about this amazing uh, collection and get some of your thoughts on the process and have a, a conversation about the comics. So cool. without further ado, let's get started. I'm nervous. <laughs> Should it's I not be this close to the microphone? Is, that, it, is this normal? It's perfect. Okay. You're great. This is, we're going to have a fun time. Uh, just Everybody some settle people. down, okay? I know. I know. Yeah, chill. We're going we're gonna to do what we can do. Um, to, to talk about each of the stories in the anthology, and we're also going to spend some time getting, uh, hopefully we'll have a little time at the end for some Q&A, but we'll see how that goes, okay? All right, so we're breaking it down by story, and I wanted to start with the uh, title track, I guess, of this anthology, Girl Town. This is a story that I think was published originally in 2015, is that right? Yeah, it was in Irene. Yeah, yeah. so that anthology, was that Hick and Hawk who published that? Uh, I don't know. That was it's, self-published. Oh, yeah, was it self-published? it's like okay. Andy Warner and Dakota McFadden's little okay. thing. Their project, yeah, that's absolutely. That sounded condescending. And, I mean, it's it's a great <laughs> anthology, but it was where the story first I mean, showed up. Yeah, when they, when they invited me, I was just like, I was blown away because I had like, never made anything, and I'm just like, okay, why me? But thanks. Um, and yeah, it was and the and the the image of the front um, uh, of the cover here is actually of one of the characters from this initial story. This is Betsy. Yeah, that's uh, Betsy. Uh, coming out of the well to shame mankind, I believe. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted, and, and one of the things I wanted to talk about to a certain degree in Girl Town is this kind of conversation about, at least initially, of there seem to be in most of your stories characters who I would call self-inserts, characters who represent you as a person. I find the entire anthology to be relatively autobiographical, and, and I want to talk about the defining characteristics of Betsy as a character that um, I think your stand-in found most admirable, that she was loud, that she was strong, and that she was angry. Mm -hmm. I, wanted, I wanted to start by talking about that. Um, I think, like, I kind of can't remember writing this, but I think like it all came off just like real slapdash. I was just like loud, angry, I don't know. Um, and I just become friends with this person, Ash Avard, and she's basically Betsy. And like, I don't know, I'd like never met anybody like her. She's like a big, she's just like a very angry, loud feminist. Um, and like, I had so much like admiration and love for her like almost immediately um, and I didn't like intend to explore that feeling with a comic but uh, it happened, it just happened um, and actually like the way she looks was just based on the uh, the painting that's referenced in the in the comic um, I don't know, I just pulled that out of nowhere, I don't know <laughs> um, but yeah, I also think there's something like just incredibly powerful about like any fat woman. Like it's like to me, it feels like political protest in some way. I don't, and this is like a half-formed thought, um, but I just find like so much power in that. Yeah, or in, in self-love of you know a person that that loves their body as a as an act of political resistance, right? Because capitalism, to a certain extent, is fueled by the fact that we all hate our bodies right. and hate ourselves. I mean, like it's something like to me, it doesn't even feel like self-love is something that like would even occur to Betsy, mm. you know, as a concept, just because it would be like such a default, you know. I yeah. Mean, like the lunch ladies all feel very like like wild outside yeah. of society and stuff like that. Um, 
And that's what's so radical about them, yeah. I guess, is that they're so outside because they're so self-accepting that it's just the default, whereas I think for most people that would actually be a, that would be not the default. Right. And for me, personally, that's not the default. I hate myself. Um, <laughs> well, this isn't about you. No, it's about you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, all these things that you just said are things that, like, never really occurred to me whatsoever. I just, like, when I wrote this, I think I just wanted to, I just write, wrote a bunch of, like, funny sentences that I liked. Like, we got kicked out of astronaut school for being too good looking to go to outer space. <laughs> I'm like, oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, that, that is a good joke but it is also a very particular kind of commentary. Yeah, no, totally. And it, it, it goes on throughout the story, and, like, I don't know. I never, um, I never like, meant to do it, I guess. Um, I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I even identified as, like, a feminist, like, at the time that I wrote this story, or, like, even thought about feminism in any way. Like, I mean, all of my stories kind of come from a place of, like, subconscious understanding or something, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I don't know, I'm, I just created these like three lunch lady characters and I, I like immediately found them very fascinating and I like didn't, I didn't know where they came from yeah. at all. I think there, to, this brings up kind of a, uh, the way I would can consider your process or your characters is that it is very subconscious but when you look at it maybe if you look back at it you're like no, oh I see this thing. I like years later reading this story I'm just like wow <laughs> like there's so much here like everything suddenly seems like extremely meaningful like I mm -hmm. finally got smart enough to read my own story like not that you have to be very very smart or anything like that but like I didn't know. I don't know. There's like just a bunch of lines that, like, to me, are now very evocative that I wrote without that intent at all. Right. It's in, in a sense, in a sense, you are letting your subconscious create the thing, and mm -hmm. then with distance, you can see what you are accessing at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Can we go back to Betsy for a second? Yeah, Betsy. I want to talk about her on the cover. Betsy shows up, I think, by my count, three times in this book. She shows up on the cover. She shows up in her story. And if I'm not mistaken, she shows up in Diana's Electric Tongue. She's referred to. Yeah. yeah. Betsy hates lies. Betsy hates lies. So here's Betsy on the cover. She, oh uh, my God. Coming out of the world of shame mankind. Oh my God. So is Betsy oh true? Shit. Wait, really? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think of that. Oh my God, that's amazing. Oh my God. You do this in your brain. Like. Betsy hates lies. Well, I'm just like, like, um, <laughs> I don't know. Like, Betsy, to me, is just like this totem of integrity. Yes. Yeah. Betsy's truth. Right? Yeah. 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 And I like I mean, when I came up with this cover I was like stoned and I just thought it would be funny. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh what if it was a manhole? <laughs> and actually, um, Olivia who's in the audience helped me take reference photos. I like made her crawl around in the street so I could like get the <laughs> angles right. Thank you. <laughs> and actually just occurred to me like the the visual joke because one of the three lines in your book, this is a book about women women's relationships to each other, and to a degree, um, the relationships with men are often in terms of process, in terms of like trauma, dysfunction, and so Betsy is this like intuitive feminist figure who is truth, who is revealing mm -hmm. the truth of what like patriarchy is, coming out of a man hole. Yeah. It's yeah. like <laughs> such a dairy, shame mankind. A little, little extra layer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I just like I, it wasn't even my first choice. Like the cover that I that I really wanted to do was like these three girls hiding in the shadows of an alleyway, mm -hmm. and um, Lee, my editor, was like, you know, this is nonsense. Like <laughs> this is like a meaningless drawing, and I'm like, so what? And he, he's the one who picked this, and I am eternally grateful. Yeah. It's a really striking cover. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I do love it. Yeah, it's love very it. good. I, I have so much affection for Betsy. Yeah. So we're moving on to radishes? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. So, uh, first off, this is like one of the most beautiful things I've ever read. Oh, wow. I, I just. I mean, it just destroys me every time I go. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so, so I mean, uh, no more hate is uh, uh, it just um, it hits the right emotional beats, and it just. But there's. You're not a little girl. Uh, well, you know, we're all kind of little you girls. Are. Yeah. Oh, there it is. 
is. Um, We're all little girls. Aren't <laughs> you? I, I, I'm left at the end, though. I'm left a little dangling at the end. That sounds weird. But um, <laughs> um, so I, I wrote down this question because I, I was trying to formulate it in my head, and and even writing it down, it sounds weird. It so, be easy. so I don't know. I don't know if it's an easy question, but it, so the ending is she she confronts herself, mm -hmm. right? Um, Beth uh, confronts herself, and so. She cries when she sees herself and apologizes yeah. to herself. Um, so throughout this whole thing, she's been self-deprecating and hating herself and the whole thing. And her friend has been telling her she's foolish for thinking that. Right. But her friend, at the same time, like, doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. you right. Know? Like, no. She's very shy. Doesn't see it Don't until, yeah. Yeah. Yourself, yeah. But so Beth sees herself, uh, hugs herself and cries. And, and it's, so here's the question. It's, uh, I wrote down, does realization of how we treat ourselves only occur when we see ourselves as others see us instead of how we see ourselves? What kind of question? It's a crazy that's question, that's right? Not that, that's like not a, that's like a larger philosophical it is, question it is, that but you think that I can tackle? I, I think you can because you, you brought up that moment right there, right? She sees herself outside of herself. Yeah. And there's that moment of understanding. Um, I mean, for me, I, I think, like, it just seemed like the obvious thing that would happen. You know, like, I, I, like, she's a compassionate person, you know, like, she, when that stupid boy tries to talk to her, she, like, lets him, you know, like, touch her arm and stuff like that, because she wants to be polite, mm -hmm. um, you know, she, like, has genuine affection for her friend, and, like, she would never like make fun of anybody for the things that she makes fun of herself for, right? right? Um, and I didn't, I mean, your question is just like so enormous it is. that I can't, I, I mean, I, I do agree in some ways, um, but it's so, I mean, it's so hard. There are some, I mean, there are some people who can do it, um, I guess, without like seeing themselves. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. And I mean, like, I think, Hmm. I, I think avatars are really powerful. Mm -hmm. oh, wow, that's just like the broadest mm -hmm. shit I mm -hmm. could come up with. It was but good. No, but it's, it's true. Cool. Like I think I think they're. Um, I don't know. I think about like self image and the like the internet a lot. Like the way you present yourself, the way that you can like then go back and reflect. Because sometimes mm -hmm. when I'm sad, I'll go read funny tweets that I made. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, oh, I'm totally useless. <laughs> I can make a joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I just have, like when I was when I was twelve, I was like weird and like chubby, and I hated going to the mall really, um, because it's like you know it's a place where you like try on clothes and see other people, and like I hate both of those things, um, and you know I would always get like dragged there by a skinny person, and so I I imparted my own mall experience just like into this fantasy realm because so I was like that seems good that's fine I can just do whatever I want here yeah. um and then I don't know I'm I'm doppelgangers are just the shit like right. I love doppelgangers um like to an extent where like I accidentally rewrite this story <laughs> like every year when I like try to write a new story I'm just like oh, just a crash it again <laughs> um <laughs> but uh yeah, I mean, to me it just seems so natural, mm -hmm. um, and it's just like it is something that I struggle with a lot because like looking in the mirror is just not a, not quite enough somehow, you know, right, like you right, just can't, right. like you can't quite get it. You have to like <coughs> echolocate like with other people right. and like with the internet and with comics, <laughs> like if you're weird. Uh, yeah. So maybe a, a follow up to that is, so there's the apology, but is there forgiveness? Does she? I mean, I don't. I don't think. Um, so, this like these doppelgangers are just sort of like friendly and benevolent, <coughs> and so like I don't think forgiveness necessarily like works into it. Um, it may not be possible. Yeah, you know, like this is just like. I don't know. 
The question is, does she forgive herself? Right. She can't, right. Can't she forgive yeah. herself? Can she forgive herself? That's up to the reader. <laughs> <laughs> I left it ambiguous. Can you forgive yourself? I don't know. Yeah. Let me think. What well, do, do, do she forgive herself? Actually, yeah. After this, yeah. she's totally fine. Oh. She doesn't, <laughs> oh. She doesn't have to go to fantasy therapy That's or good. any of that. Yeah. She doesn't have to take fantasy Zoloft. No, I'm sorry. What are the uh, there goes ambiguity. What do you yeah. think, Rob? What do you think? Um, I think not entirely because it's not that easy. Right. But I yeah. think it's a first step. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what I gathered in the story. Mm -hmm. And there's something else here is if you look at the bottom left panel, her friend is looking at this and one gets the sense that she comprehends a little of what her friend is feeling right. for the very first time yeah. and, and it draws and, them together. And now she sees her in a new way too. This is a really good story. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a really good story. It's, it's, like, it's like you want to make maths because it's good or something. Yeah, right? I don't, I don't get it. I don't know. That's, that's an enormous trick being put and, on me. <laughs> and, and you do that, and there's, I mean, the, one of the writing things in your book is you, you have a sense of her strength as a storyteller. And you manage to convey that in her friends in a new way, in an extremely simple way, just with her eyebrows and the yeah. way that you draw mm -hmm. yeah. like the dots in her eyes. Yeah, I've always regretted not adding a word balloon where she says, I now understand your feelings. Better. <laughs> 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 I really would have driven it home. You know? yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little too much. <laughs> One of the things that strikes me about this conversation right now is how intuitive you are when you make work. That there's not that that it seems like a lot of this stuff coalesces out of your subconscious. That it's not a like I'm going to make a story about X, and then it, and it's like all the pieces and parts really kind of come together in a way that's you know kind of unique and beautiful. If I if I try to go that direction, I always make total garbage. Like mm -hmm. I tried really hard to like write an outline for like a YA graphic novel pitch about like a magical escape room, but like. Why A by its nature always feels like really lessony to me. So I'm like, there must be some sort of like lesson imparted in this story. And as soon as I like thought of that, like the whole thing just died. It like became yeah. so static and boring. Like honestly, I always just try to do like the funnest thing. Like if I knew that this story was gonna be about this, it would have been a lot worse. It would have been so bad. I don't know. Like. Because it becomes didactic, right? It yeah, becomes, exactly, yeah. exactly. We're, I mean, like, I, I think of stories like puzzles, but they're like really messy puzzles, you know? Like, the symbols that you want to use are going to be, like, they're not perfect, you know, they're not, you can't just, like, take a rose and a mirror or whatever, like, that's boring. Um, You're right, they're not perfect. They're that's not perfect. perfect. Yeah. Like, and I try to, I don't know, mostly I try to just do whatever is going to be fun. It's going to be cool, fun to draw, for one thing. I mean, I'm constantly struck by the lack of solution in the endings right. of your stories. Right. And I, I think it's, A, not quite up to the reader, because the reader can't solve it. Nobody can. Mm -hmm. It's just, like, real life. I, well, I, I don't think there are any, like, pieces of short fiction that I enjoy that, are, like, do have, like, a really strong resolution. Yeah. I don't know. I wouldn't be as effective if yeah. I did. Well, I, yeah, if, if it did have a pat ending, I don't think these stories would be as good as they are. I mean, I think part of it also is just that I don't want to do more than I have to. <laughs> <laughs> that's like that's like a really big part of it. Like, I'm not going to show them like, walking home or whatever. I've drawn enough trees, you know? <laughs> Like, like walking home and holding hands. Yeah, and yeah. The sun has got a smiley yeah, face. Yeah, exactly, and yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like she goes home and sees her mom and hugs her mom or whatever. I don't know. I love you, mom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <it's> true. <laughs> whatever. Um, the way I hammer it home. Yeah, right. yeah. Which is, I don't, I don't know. It's just like, I'd rather. I think I made an analogy in Your Chicken Enemy in a recent interview about like the, the story's like a bucket full of water and I'm just like spinning it and spinning it and I just try to let go at the most exciting time or something, mm -hmm. like at the time that feels like right to me. Um, it's like, I just don't really think about resolutions ever because they don't exist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They don't really exist. Yeah. That's true, yeah. that's true. 
They don't, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna trick people into thinking resolutions exist. I don't think it resonates when you try to. Right. Right. But there are moments of realization, though. Yeah, throughout. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is like a more interesting thing, yeah, probably. Yeah, absolutely. Like yeah. unmoored yeah. epiphanies, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's, where we, that's where we leave this piece. And so I wanna kind of move on to our next Next comic, um, a, another Ignatz winning uh, comic. This originally published by Shortbox. Yeah. Um, and then I think you republished it. Uh, th yeah, on my um, own. Before uh, uh, Jules took this piece, or no, I'm sorry, Rob took this piece. Um, but before we started, one of the things I wanted to ask you, it seems like throughout the life of Diana's Electric Tom, it seems, seems to me that as though it went through multiple revisions. It did. Yeah, you the the initial piece from Shortbox, there was different coloring, different panel like panel like modifications, I guess. Mm. It wouldn't the drawings weren't necessarily that much different. But. Yeah, I mean, it was a really stupid exercise, honestly, cuz like when I initially made Diana's electric tongue, I did it in like a month and a half, and at the same time I like moved. So, um, when I was totally done with it, I hated it so much, and I like sent it off to Zainab, and I, I was just like, she's never gonna forgive me for this, it's so bad. Um, and so, like, it came out, and when I had the chance to republish it, I was like, well, I'm gonna spend some time with this and make it better. And um, I like, I basically made it, I tried to make it look a little bit like, I don't know, warmer or something. A little goopier and like I like where I landed but this is me pulling way back like I spent a month doing like weird stupid little revisions to the thing and I did this like really elaborate detailed cover and in the end I was like this is just not as good as the original in any way it was like such a big waste of time um, but I learned a lesson about like cartooning I don't know it's just like the drawing, everything about the book was totally fine. It was just me being crazy, you know, which I am, I am right to do. <laughs> it, it is your work, I mean, and, yeah. and revising, you know, there's a, there's a long history of revising work in this, this, I guess, group. Like, people go back and change things right. um, all the time. Rob, you had some questions back there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, one of the things that's striking about the book in general the material was put over, over a long period of time, but if you didn't know that, the collection would feel very fluid and unified. And I think that has a lot to do with what we've discussed before, is that you approach everything very intuitively. So the same subconscious themes that drive one story are kind of driving another. And as a result, there's a through line throughout the book in terms of unified themes. And when I wrote about it, I talked about the one that's most striking to me is that this is a book that is fundamentally about trauma. Trauma and loss. And the way it is processed. But what is interesting is that through every story, all the trauma is off panel. You never see it. And, <laughs> and, Sorry. And, and then every person is like dealing with it in a different way some in healthy ways and some in unhealthy ways. And because in this story in particular, there's two significant traumas. She has this horrible physical accident and she's like very clear about it the entire time. And she had this monumentally devastating breakup and like this whole story is about how like, oh, I'm happy, he's happy. And I guess my question is, is that... I'm stopping. You're just like, <laughs> And I'm like, oh god, sorry, go on, go on. And you bring up her glibness, I'm just like, oh my god. <laughs> you, you once said that I, I read your, your stories better Wait. than you do. Oh, absolutely. Which I thought was hilarious. Absolutely. I, I don't pick up on any of it. Like, you're talking about trauma, and when you said that all the trauma happens, like, off panel, like, and, and like she's really glib about it. I have to tell you that at the time that I wrote all of these stories, I like, there was like so much shit that I like didn't realize about myself. Like, as far as that kind of stuff goes, I was just like, this is, this is a story about someone who's got some, some shit. Not, it's not me. <laughs> it's not me, it's someone else, you see? <laughs> she's 
got different hair slightly. <laughs> um, her bedroom looks exactly like my bedroom, but that's just because I'm lazy and I didn't feel like designing something. And that's just the way you like drawing noses. And that's just the way I like drawing noses. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't interrupt you. No, so, I mean, so basically, uh, one of the ways that she processes the trauma in this book is with Harper. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm, I'm fascinated as to like what made you choose this kind of like, you know, in, in put him in this role because he's doing this because that's what he's programmed to do. He's not an actual lover, he's not an actual partner. Right. It's all, it's, me, it's, a, it's a mediation of feeling. Um, and in, in thinking about it now, in retrospect, does doing art, is doing art something that is something... Yes. Help. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was going to say, help, help, help feeling from. Is it immediate, like, this isn't me, this isn't a real partner. Yeah, and like, she's blonde. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Things like about my self-insert characters, like, oh, no, she's blonde. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. But, no, you finish your question. Yeah, so it's like, um, none of this is conscious, you say, but how do you feel, does, does any of this help deal with things you feel you have felt afterwards? Or is it all this, <laughs> of all this subconscious? Or does it take years to realize, <laughs> oh, that's what I was doing? Yeah, well, I got divorced. <laughs> so, so the truth will out even if you try to sublimate it into comics. It seems crazy how it does that. Um, but I mean, it like what you just said is like exactly what I've been doing all these years without even like realizing it. Because when I wrote this story, I'm just like I did all the most obvious things. Like that, I I was like is a robot, and then she says this to the robot, because of course she does, or whatever. Um, and like, you know, I just thought, a robot tongue is funny, and like, she can talk with it, but not taste, and like, I don't know, like there wasn't some grand design, and then when people react to the story, and they're like, oh, it's about trauma, and like, you know, because Diana is just, she's me, she's me. Um, and I wasn't like identifying at the same time, I like wasn't identifying with that part, right? You know, yeah. like I was like all the glibness, mm -hmm. you know, and like none of the other stuff. Um, the, the physical trauma, in a lot of ways, is also a metaphor for the emotional trauma, right? Yeah, exactly. It's a way of just like putting it out there, right? Right, and it like now that I'm thinking about it, um, she like gets into a motorcycle accident and loses her tongue, and it's never clear whether it was like intentional. Yeah. Or not like if like like was she being reckless was she being safe or was it intentional and that also feels like very natural to me because it's like you get fucked up by something and then like your reaction to it seems almost like out of your control mm -hmm. and like you I don't know like trauma can do so many different things and it's like not it's not a conscious choice I guess or I don't know I don't know where I'm going with this well <laughs> well I want to I want to jump in because I do th I think I ha I have um, at least my reading of the story I think that it was recklessness because Diana is constantly reckless mm. constantly making reckless decisions living audaciously yeah mm. oh. and sometimes <laughs> sometimes sometimes so audaciously right um, even this this series of panels right here is reckless it's not to the degree of you know racing on a motorcycle or whatever mm -hmm. um i also wanted to bring up how some of the other characters in this specific story are so thoughtless um for example that the ex-boyfriend blue who sends uh tulips that she that have petals that are supposed to taste like hot dogs or whatever but she can't there's no confirmation that those were him yeah, well, she but that. she thinks she is, she thinks that she'll never know. She won't. That's <laughs> true. But I mean, I guess she could have a nurse try them. But yeah, <laughs> but if they were from him, <laughs> and he sent them to her with that, you know, it's like it's you know, there's a thoughtlessness from him, but to a certain degree, there's also a thoughtlessness from 
her friends, right? People that she really cares about who are seeing what she's going through um, and just seeing the superficial pieces of it. Right, well, like, if she can't engage with it, like, her friends can't engage with it either, right. you know? Like, if she's going to put up a wall, then, like, her friends will, you know, respect that, quote-unquote. But um, I mean, conversely, one of the things that struck me the most about this entire book is the lack of actual villains. Like, even Sabine could have become a villain really quickly mm-hmm. and she doesn't quite get there like she's no, decent she's, she's, she's nice yeah she's got it together you want to hate her yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. You, you desperately yeah. want to hate her yeah. and like you kind of can't yeah not even diana can right she's just like uh, i think in the whole book there's like one person who could conceivably be called a villain and it's the dude in radishes who i affectionately refer to as like the puzzle chud <laughs> <laughs> but there's no one you know, it, it's like maybe like thinking about what you guys are saying. Maybe the villain is strong. <laughs> the villain was inside the house the whole time, right? I mean, isn't it always? It is. Yeah. It is always. Um, Jules, you wanted to bring up a point about these next few pages. Oh think. yeah, these are my two favorite pages in the whole book. I think, I mean, of many favorites. I, I think this is just where everything culminates, and you know, Diana is is. Uh, putting all of her emotional energy into this um, faux person who can't quite respond. A lot of emphasis has been put on Blue, her ex-boyfriend, and how he was constantly like hyper-focused on her emotional state, and she would feel like she was fine, and he would say, are you okay, are you okay? And she'd feel okay, but he was picking up on something she couldn't. Right. And in the meantime- she doesn't engage with her feelings. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And then she, she you know, <gasps> turns you to- <laughs> No, this is good. This is the page where she turns to Harbor, and she's like clearly like destroyed, and he's just like, oh hey, and 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 she has to really confront the fact that she's been pouring all of her emotion, you know, into this um, band aid person who's Mm -hmm. not really a person and can't reciprocate and can't understand her, and she has. This is where I think she has to grapple with that. She has to stop being in denial. I think this is like an incredible moment in this story. Mm-hmm. Just the, the moment of the destruction of denial. Yeah. That's not really it's a really question. It's really good. It is yeah, really good. It is. It's not a question. It, it's, it's like a declaration that I, I freaking love this book. <laughs> I was wondering why you like emailed me and you were like, those pages, please. <laughs> I just wanted love on them. Oh, so good. Thank you, Jules. So I wanted to ask. I it's wanna... just like fascinating because I'm just like, oh, that's about it. Cool. I'll take that to my next panel. <laughs> I want to talk about this image. It's really interesting to me because um, she's resting and this is meant to be sort of a moment of intimacy, but it also feels like, looks like she's laying in a coffin. Yeah. And it's like, it's kind of representative of multiple levels of talking to Harbor, actually talking about her feelings, engaging with it is healing but he's also not the solution. He's not the answer. He's not gonna fix her. And this is like kind of... Yeah, well, what she wants very specifically is like an empty person Mm. to like just, I don't know, she doesn't, like she doesn't, she does not want to be seen, Mm. right? you know, by like another human being because like human beings are so complex, you know, and like terrifying and like you have no ability to control them, um, which is why she builds tiny houses, I guess. That was also just like, Right. And this is just a really interesting image that kind of confirms it's like he's dead. He's, he's effectively dead. He doesn't exist. Yeah. yeah. And she's still like, I think I'll sleep here. Yeah, right. <laughs> but in this hugely prominent place here is also her fake tongue. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, ostensibly at the moment, she can't speak. You know, she has this like, fuck. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, has, she has this like, I get it. Good. I get it. Yeah. I get it now. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's removed like if she was behaving recklessly she like intentionally self-harmed in this way that left her unable to express herself and here's her cuddling up to a dude who is not a dude who's not real who who can't really understand her and in a way this is just like an image of her forcibly putting herself in a position where she can't be understood because she hasn't been and now she doesn't want to be and she has to deal with that 
No, don't make her make you cry. <laughs> you know, if you've never read this story, life is upsetting, isn't it? If, if you guys have never read this, I, I like highly recommend being slightly drunk when you do, because you will cry. You'll cry a lot, and it'll feel really good. That was also not a question, was it? No. Okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Just. Just the sickest beats from Jules. Down there. Yeah. Just, just absolutely. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, question mark? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jules, you had some questions about the big burning house. Yeah, so uh, as much as I love every other story in this book, this I, this is my favorite. Wow. Because it's... The dark horse. Yeah, it's so freaking weird. I love it. Like, so you're... you're this is an eight-page story. Right? Yeah. And the world building you do here, like by way of, I counted uh, 10 different internet platforms. You've got IMDb, you've got oh, eBay, man. you've got fanfiction.net, you've got YouTube. Creating like, the was such a pain in the ass. I bet it was, but it looks freaking amazing. And, and there's nothing that, I've never seen anything like this. Like you, you build up this background within eight pages just by like, sh sh being, like convincingly using tech to show us like hints of this um, like like huge internet obsession. And like my, my actually the thing I was most excited to find uh, in this story was was the, the title image, like the one right before the story starts, which is just the videotape. Um, and it just says the big burning house. Uh -huh. But also it says Harvey. And yeah. Harvey's crossed out. Yeah. And that's a movie about a huge Thing everybody becomes obsessed with that nobody can see. Oh, that's hilarious. I actually did that just because um, when I was a kid, there was just always this VHS tape that had some movie on it <laughs> that I watched all the time, but it, it had previously had Harvey on it. My dad was like always reusing VHS tapes and it had Harvey crossed out on it. It was just like an image that I yeah. had from childhood. I think you crossed out Harvey. You picked it up subconsciously. Yeah, I guess. Ours was Wayne's World. That wouldn't have worked nearly as well. <laughs> <laughs> I had to work him in somehow. I mean, can you can you talk to us a little bit about your I don't know, your thought process and like creating like creating this like really vivid, viable universe that like we can really believe in? Like we can believe this obsession by the end of this. I mean you got SoundCloud, like I don't have to name them all, but like they're they're all perfectly done. They're mm -hmm. spot on and there's there's not like a hint of falsity. Well, yeah, I mean, I feel like if you kind of, like, if it, instead of deviant art, it was, like, door beamed art or whatever, <laughs> like, you kind of, like, lose it right there, you know, right. like, door um, art. <laughs> there's this movie called, uh, it's that movie about, like, people getting murdered on Facebook and the whole thing takes place. Searching. Unfriended. 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 And, like, um, Unfriended takes place on a computer screen, and um, I don't know how they like licensed this or like what deal they had, but they used like real Facebook and like real YouTube and stuff. And if they hadn't, I mean, it's not like an amazing movie, but it would have been a lot worse, you know? Like, you need to like come up with the like. If I was gonna make up one website, I would have had to make them all up, you know? Right. Um, but you didn't even have to name them. You 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 recreated them so like spot on that like oh, so I can be like oh yeah that is fanfiction.net and that that kind of stings like yeah well that I, mean, I recognize well there's also there's also the fact that like I'm like the the people who are going to understand what's happening in this story and the people who are going to understand like the way that these girls are talking to each other um about this weird thing are the people who are going to be able to identify all those websites you know because like um yeah well is that a question yeah, I just I just wanted to hear more about how you like came up with the oh the the different how did you like select those I, I guess it's I mean it all just kind of like um, like grew naturally like you just like imagined your own obsessions like back in the day um well at, this is actually based on a podcast that um, my friend at the time and I were doing um, and like you know I just whole hog was like obviously I should just do a comic about podcast and like fandom and stuff and you know of course the thing that 
that was true of our podcast and is true of like many fandom podcasts is that it's hardly about the thing that you're talking about. You know, it's yeah. like hardly about so like in this, nobody's even seen it. You know, like nobody can like even tell you like the plot of this movie, like all the way through. Um and uh yeah, I just like I'm, like Reddit seemed obvious to me, like fan fiction of course, like um, just these people who are like creating this like weird community around this thing that like just barely exists. And um, along those lines, you're talking about podcasts aren't about the thing that they're really about. <clears throat> Lots of stories in your book aren't about the thing that they're about. Oh yeah, like a sex robot. Oh fun. Yeah. <laughs> and and it's it's kind of another th- a through line is that this book is called Girl Town. This is a book about women, but also women's relationships with other women yeah. of various kinds as. Um, and in particular, um, women's friendships. Mm-hmm. And the thing that really struck me in the story is that despite all of like the nutty imagery and you know, the multiplayer thing, this is a story about two friends who love each other and that love is mediated through this ridiculous thing. Because what's, what, is, what's the most, what are the most dominant images on this page? The answer is not on the pictures, the answer is the dialogue yeah. mm-hmm. and the lettering. And that actually is a detail of your work I really appreciate is your lettering. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and here, when you look at the way that it's like, it's not lined up perfectly, um, each line, there's like this little, it's almost, it's, it feels like it's drawn, like the way a character curves and is drawn, so too are like the lines in your, each line, you know, makes it feel Gives it, shall we say, very similar to. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, yes, I got my own very similar to. So, um, and and it makes it really adds a level of intimacy because yeah. bad, bad. There's nothing that can take a reader out of the story quicker. Bad lettering, computer lettering, like you know, this is, and in, in, in other stories where we like use big word balloons and like giant letters and things like that. It's, do you have, is, is your letting process entirely intuitive or is, is any of this intentional in terms of the way you're putting this together? This, figuring this out took me like a really long time um, just because like I had the script, like that was, that was the easy part, um, but like figuring out how it was all gonna fit on the page together was like a huge pain in the ass. So like, I mean, which was fun, it was like a puzzle. Um, and I, I don't know, like, lettering just is what it is for me. I'm just like, whatever works, I don't, I don't think about it that hard. I mean, I try to just, like, reflect the mood of whatever in the letters, I guess. The, the speed's really evocative. Like, you can really get a sense of how the conversation is paced. You right. Know, like, even here on this page, you can see the, the pause. Right. You can see yeah. where... Like someone's sort of interrupting a little, and where someone is holding off. I like the part about being quite quick. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm afraid we have to keep on moving because we don't uh, have a whole lot of time left. I wanted to talk. This is the last piece in the book, mm-hmm. and my favorite of the collection. Um, really? Yeah. Oh. Um, I think. One of the things that uh, really, I, I wanted to pick this image specifically because of what is said here. And I think um, without, um, without really diving too deeply into the comic, because I don't want to spoil it for everybody, but this last panel down here at the bottom feels to me like a statement to yourself. <laughs> yeah. But also, I think, a statement to other women generally. Someone, someone actually said that to me. I don't know who it was. Um, yeah, sorry. Was it? I think one of, <laughs> you know, I think this is, you know, one of the things I think, I guess my question about this, as we've talked, you know, a lot of the, uh, the, a lot of the push and pull of narratives in Girl Town is associated with trauma. And most of the time it's romantic trauma or trauma, you know, where people are more or less equals. Um, And in this specific book, or in this specific story, the the trauma actually comes from a a place, 
you know, of when uh, the main character was a child. So it's it's uh, the relationship between um, a grown child and adult parents, you know. And we see a home video that um, let's just say messed me up for a while. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. In, a, in a big way. Um, so there's this story just felt to me. Um, this was the. I think this story to me represents a turning point in terms of honesty. It's more open about what you're talking about. It's more brutal than the other work in the collection. Um, and I wanted to just hear your thoughts on what writing this story was about. Um, well, I just got divorced. Yeah. <laughs> My parents were being dicks about it. Um, and I don't know, like, I had to do another story for the book. Yeah. <laughs> and I just, like, I wrote, um, like I always do, I wrote like four or five things that like I thought were going to be really meaningful. Um, and then, you know, they just turned out really static. But I, I did come up with the jar of fingernails um, like in that process. And I was really happy that I got to use it. Because um, moms be crazy. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just like this weird, there's like this condescension kind of constantly happening to the main character um and like and, and again it's like not something that I I was I wasn't trying to like intentionally process anything you know like because I didn't think I have since gotten a therapist like after all of this book, and I'm like now very worried that my work is gonna suck from, like going forward. So I'm just like, oh, that's there's that feeling that I talked to my therapist about. It was here all along in this book um, that I made. Um, like there's a part where she's thinking about like uh, how like she thinks her dad is angry at her for getting a divorce, but mm -hmm. then she's like, no, he doesn't think that anger is useful. Yeah. Um, which is like true of my own dad and I just never like I don't know I like never thought about it in a way that was like very significant yeah. like you kind of spill yet, your yeah when I like wrote that throwaway line I'm like this seems like a good place to have this thought yeah and like I'm just I'm gonna include it and I don't know why like but in that last panel um why don't we see her eyes so it's like it's like you zero in just on her mouth. Is that to emphasize? Listen to what she's saying. It just seemed like the right thing to do, I guess. Yeah, it's that intuitive nature of your work. I think um, to me that not seeing her eyes, you know, knowing that she could be with her eyes closed and whispering this, you know, no one knows what you're capable of. Mm -hmm. To me, this was. Um, I mean, I'm I'm trying not to cry right now. Um, it's, well, it's also just like very like. I think mouths are very like intimate. And, yeah. Like, mm. yeah. The the lips are the most sensitive part of the body, other than the fingertips, mm -hmm. right? You know, we you know you kind of see that. Um, also, sp spoiler alert: I've read Casey's new mini. It yeah. does not suck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was, was going to yeah. make that comment. I was like, no, see, I bought your new book and it read excellent. it, and it's good. <laughs> so uh, definitely is, devastating in its own way. Is it? Can, is it? You think it's as good as like the stuff in Girls? Yes. 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 Thank yeah. you. Right. Yeah. 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 I Go on by it. It's, it's, a, it's, it's at the clearly, disc press. It's a clearly different table. direction. I don't know why I'm constantly convinced that I'm just gonna like get worse. Like, in case you're only gonna get better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like that doesn't usually happen to people. I mean, and and, and talking about except for Lee Scott. Right, and and, <laughs> and and talking about like the relationship between artists and mental illness, um, and trauma, un unprocessed trauma, unprocessed mental illness makes you worse. It prevents you from doing art. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's absolutely true. Like, now that I'm like, I'm just so you know, I'm feeling a lot better. Um, and, like, the ideas I'm having now are, like, less personal in some ways. I don't know. Like, it's going to be different, but it's going to be excellent. Yeah. I, I think no matter what happens, even if they seem less personal now, I think if we look at them in a few years. Yeah, yeah. Like in a couple years when we're doing the same thing, I'm going to be saying the yeah. same stuff. Yeah. Or I'm like, I don't know. Because <laughs> no matter what you're. She's blonde! <laughs> and many artists who do like really striking emotional stuff 
you're, you're not the only person who works in a completely intuitive way. Like Chris Ware does exactly the same thing. And uh, really? He, yes. All of his pages. Shocks me. <laughs> all of his pages are are improvised. Wow. And um, the emotional content in them, because I've like made similar comments about his work in terms of like, well, the, you know, these characters in this position you know, represent this, this, and this. And he's like, oh yeah, I see that now. <laughs> um, and and I see, and, and I think that's an excellent way to do art. I wonder if he's ever gone to therapy. Mm. Mm. Uh, <laughs> this seems like a. That seems that this seems, seems like, like an inappropriate question. That, that seems like a that seems like a place to wrap things up. <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've been listening to I'll a live version. Yeah, you've been. Yeah, we've got. Uh, I was about to say you've been listening to a live version of Enemies of the State here at SBX. We've got time for one audience question. If anybody wants to ask us or Casey a question, the mics on both sides of the auditorium are live. So if you want to chat. <laughs> Hi, stranger. Hi, big fan. <laughs> well, actually, I'm curious. Like, what's some of the new stuff you're working on? Because I'm really excited for it. <laughs> well, um, I got the Ha Ha, which is my new mini, um, which is being sold right now as we speak. And um, the thing that I'm working on next is a little dad. It's like even more personal than this. I lied. Um, <laughs> It's just about, um, it's more about like, it's more, it's more trauma processing, I guess. Um, it's about, um, it's like semi-autobiographical, it's about a girl who um, is like ruthlessly anorexic and like cruel and her shitty high school boyfriend. But there are all these like moments in it where she's like imagining these fan fictions. Um, called Bright Young Thing. I hope someone publishes it, basically. Um, yeah, that's, that's my next big thing, hopefully. Thank you for your question, young lady. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> It's gonna make you feel. If this made you feel bad, um, you don't even <laughs> get ready. I don't. I don't know that it's. Say, I would say it made me feel bad. It just made me feel a lot. Yeah, Let's put it that way. I'm glad it's your favorite because it's like, I don't know. I think I've always just thought I was like, this is just my dirty laundry. I found know? the ending of this one particularly devastating. Yeah. yeah. Really? I yeah, think, it scared then, me, honestly. I was afraid. I, yeah. Good. The, yeah. the ending, you know, I always had a question about that ending, and, I, and, and, and really my thought was is that maybe for the first time at the end of the story, you are actually seeing yourself for the first time. Mm. Ew. Mm. Ew. Yeah. Stop looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid yeah. that's where we're going to have to leave it yeah, for the day. Yeah, I again, I was just like, this happens. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm Alex from Enemies of the State. Rob Clough from High Love. Jules Speaks, freelance critic. Daniel Loken from Your Chicken Enemy. And we've been talking with Casey Noack about her Ignatz winning Girl Town from Top Shelf. Pick up a copy at Top Shelf's booth and pick up her new mini comic at that's Disquette that's Press. Yeah, Disquette Press. Take L. I love 14. I 14. There we go. It's there's a lot of great stuff on that yeah. booth, so you yeah. can't go wrong. Yeah. Thank you everyone for coming. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.